All right, and very exciting to have everybody joining us here today for what is our fourth and last Meet the Researchers for 2021. And we have some tired but excited, incredible researchers with us this afternoon. Now, I, I won't admit this in person. Oops, too late. We're being recorded. Um, but this is one of my most exciting Meet the Researchers of this year. So we, we certainly have a collective of some incredible up and coming stars in their research fields to share with you today how they are combating despicable disease through their collaborations and their research pursuits. So for those, I did chat to a couple of people as you joined us today. And um, for those of you who aren't aware, the Institute for Molecular Bioscience is coming to the end of celebrating its very Australian 21st year. Um, so we didn't pass around a key and get everybody to sign it as you want to do on your 21st birthday. But we've spent this year reflecting on the incredible personalities that have come through this building to date and the legacy that has been created in that short time. So I did share with one gentleman just before that the Institute was actually born of the brainchild of our founding director, John Maddock, Professor John Maddock, and also um, the Honourable Peter B. And at that time, they negotiated um, on thanks to a rather significant philanthropic gift that was made to UQ. And we now know that that was the first gift made to Queensland from Atlantic Philanthropies, Mr Chuck Feeney and his wonderful wife, Helga. And with that, they leveraged the creation of what was the first institute at UQ. And we were founded to be a lighthouse. So to take the incredible research capabilities that were happening in the UQ landscape and really set it up as a lighthouse to be a beacon for further excellence to come to UQ. And we have delivered on that in spades in two short decades. In fact, um, we've had, I think, 13 spin-outs to date that are still in market, including um, some incredible candidates that are either on the verge or in clinical trials that are looking really exciting for different debilitating diseases and also some real impact in the environmental space as well. So without too much further ado, I'm going to move along and introduce our incredible researchers for the day. I'll introduce each of them as they come up. And then at the close of the fourth presentation, we'll move into a Q&A opportunity. Um, so for those of you who are joining us in the online space, there is a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So please put your wonderful questions in there. For those of you in the room with us today, please keep them at hand, ready to ask them when you can fire away at these incredible minds, not too, not too far in the future. So our first but not least researcher who will be sharing her incredible work with you very shortly is Dr. Meredith Redd. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yeah. And so the work that Meredith is doing in partnership with our group leader, Nathan Palpant, is just so exciting. She's essentially looking at ways to address the ischemic heart um, attacks. And also there's a couple of projects filtering out of that as well that essentially could be game changer. I hope I'm not overstating that for you, Meredith. So she's a postdoctoral research fellow with UQ and um, her current work is on the development of new therapies and strategies to combat, as I mentioned, ischemic attacks in the heart. And her focus for her pH response, with a focus on the pH responsive ion channel, ASIC1A, and the therapeutic potential of the H. I1A and the ASIC1A inhibiting peptide discovered from the venom of the Australian funnel web spider, the Kalgari spider, as I believe it's called. And with this research, Meredith hopes to pave the way for the clinical use of the H1A to have a positive impact on patients suffering from cardiovascular disease. And now, Meredith, I do need to ask your apologies in mentioning the Indigenous um, nature of the spider. I remember that I have omitted to do probably one of the most poignant things right at the start, which is to um, the acknowledgement of country. My apologies, ladies and gentlemen. The University of Queensland acknowledges the traditional owners and their custodianship on the lands on which we meet. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to the Australian and global landscape. And now with that, it's my pleasure to ask Meredith to come and take the microphone.
Thank you, Kamara, for the introduction. Can you all hear me? No. Yes, okay. <laughs> I thought I saw someone shaking their head. Um, all right, so I have the pleasure today of kicking off today's Meet the Researcher session by telling you about my work on the acid sensing ion channel 1A and its role as a potential new therapeutic target for ischemic heart disease. I'll start by just highlighting that cardiovascular disease accounts for nearly one third of all deaths in the human population with ischemic heart disease accounting for over 40% of that number. Despite decades of research into the pathological response to cardiac ischemia, there are still no standard of care drugs that can be used to actually protect the heart during this type of injury. So discoveries in this area could have a substantial impact in a variety of clinical indications where the heart undergoes an injury such as ischemia. And this could include myocardial infarction, which is more commonly known as heart attack, cardiopulmonary bypass surgery, out of hospital cardiac arrest, as well as heart transplantation. So in general, cardiac ischemia refers to a lack of oxygen and nutrients, and this occurs when there's reduced blood flow to a region of the heart for a period of time. Sustained ischemia leads to a metabolic shift within the cell, which leads to an accumulation of acidic byproducts, which ultimately results in decreased pH. This resulting tissue acidosis, as you can imagine, is not good, and it's why we've become interested in the acid sensing ion channel 1A, or more commonly known as ASIC 1A. So ASIC 1A becomes activated at low pH, and in the context of neurons as well in the brain, it has known functions in learning memory and fear, but it also is known to modulate the response to ischemia in the brain, such as in stroke. So the goal of my research is to determine if ASIC 1A similarly modulates the response to ischemia in the heart, and if so, can we use pharmacological inhibition of this channel um, in order to provide therapeutic protection? So to start, we used human population genetics to assess whether natural variation in the ASIC1A locus um, is uh, significantly associated with ischemic diseases. And indeed, we found that single nucleotide polymorphisms are significantly associated with acute myocardial infarction and major coronary heart disease, as well as small vessel stroke. But to experimentally test the role of ASIC1A in the heart, we use a model known as induced pluripotent stem cell derived cardiomyocytes. Essentially what this means is we can generate contractile cardiomyocytes, which physically, con which are the functional unit of the heart, which physically contract in the same way that your heart physically contracts all day long in order to pump blood throughout your body. And we can generate these cells from a human source in order to allow us to do human disease modeling in a dish. So to study ASIC1A, we first generated a knockout cell line. And we found that the loss of ASIC1A does not affect our ability to produce cardiomyocytes. However, we can then take these cells that we have in a dish and then su subject them to an injury very similar to what occurs during cardiac ischemia. So to do this, we actually mimic that ischemia acidosis process that occurs during an injury such as a heart attack by treating the cells to low oxygen as well as low pH for a period of time. And then we then simulate reperfusion by replacing the media with normal pH and culturing the cells for a little bit longer. When we utilize this injury model, we see anywhere from 40 to 50% cell death in a normal population of cells in what we call our wild type cells. But very excitingly, when we actually knock out the ASIC1A gene, we get reduced cell death in these populations, as you can see here in that blue line. So now that we know that the loss of ASIC1A provides protection to these cells, we wondered if we, if we directly activate this channel, does it have the opposite effect? Do we actually cause cell death? So to do this, we actually used a fascinating peptide called mitoxin, which is an ASIC1A agonist. What that means is it activates the channel rather than inhibiting it. When we treat our cells with this peptide, nothing much really happens at normal physiological pH. However, when we combine treatment at low pH, um, we start to see exacerbated cell death responses of these populations at pH, which would normally not affect these cells. All right, so in order to find pharmacological inhibitors of ASIC1A, now we turn to spider venom, as Kamara mentioned in my introduction. So the two most potent inhibitors of ASIC1A, PCTX1 and HI1A, were both originally discovered from spider venom. In general, spider venoms can contain more than 10 million bioactive peptides, making them a very valuable resource for drug discovery. HI1A in particular was discovered a number of years ago by our collaborators here at the IMB, Professor Glenn King and his group. This is just a quick video demonstrating how we go about extracting venom from these sorts of spiders so that we can then study them for drug discovery. 
All right, so now that we have these peptides, one of the first things we need to do is confirm that they're not going to have unwanted off-target effects. So this data here just shows a quick example of the sorts of experiments we might do to confirm that we're not going to have those unwanted effects. So in this case, we found that both HI1A and PCTX1 have no deleterious effects on normal cardio electro electromechanical function of these cardiomyocytes. When we put these, cardio or these peptides into our um, cell culture model system that I explained a few slides ago, again, we see that both HI1A and PCTX1 are able to reduce cell death in much of the same way that we saw with our um, genetic loss of function line. So together, these results from our cell culture model demonstrates that ASIC1A modulates cell death in human cardiomyocytes during uh, an ischemic acidosis injury in, in a dish. So we next wanted to see whether this translates to improved functional recovery. And for this, we used an ex vivo model of ischemia reperfusion, where we cannulate a heart and hook it up to an ex vivo perfusion rig. Um, this allows us to essentially maintain physiological pressure and temperature outside of the body and record function continuously over time. We can then induce an ischemic injury by simply stopping flow and then resuming flow. And in these experiments, we can deliver the peptide in whichever time course we, we would like. So this is an example injury trace of what this actually looks like, where we see essentially a complete loss of function that's, which drops to zero in our, uh, during the ischemic period. And then eventually the mice or the hearts recover to about 20% function at the end of the reperfusion period. And hearts treated with either HI1A or PCTX1 show remarkably improved function, as you can see here in these blue and, and, blue, blue and green lines. All right, so now we wanted to know whether HI1A could be, is therapeutically effective in a clinically relevant model um, of heart attack. So for this, we used a model of myocardial infarction, where we deliver HI1A immediately prior to occlusion of the left anterior descending artery, which is actually the main artery that supplies blood to the heart. In these experiments, we can then monitor contractile recovery of the hearts over time, and then eventually look at the amount of fibrosis that has occurred, or essentially the amount of injury that the heart has sustained. And I hope you can appreciate from these pictures, as well as from this quantification, that in our HI1A treated hearts, we have substantially reduced fibrosis of HI1A treated hearts. And then looking at our echocardiography data of cardiac function, we can see that the HI1A treated hearts have remarkably improved function in terms of a couple of different parameters that we've assessed shown here. So as you can imagine, patients who are suffering from a heart attack, they don't know they're going to have a heart attack before it occurs. So in our prior experiment where we actually delivered the drug prior to the ligation of the artery is not ideal. Ideally, we'd like to be able to, to deliver the drug after that onset of ischemia. So we performed an additional follow-up experiment where we tested three different delivery time points shown here with HI1A delivered after the onset of ischemia, as well as much later after the onset of ischemia, so 35 minutes later, but immediately before reperfusion. And in these experiments, we then assessed myocardial viability 24 hours later. And we were very excited to see that even when HI1A was delivered up to 35 minutes after the onset of ischemia, we were still able to see improved viability um, at HI1A, and which is comparable to what we see if we delivered the drug uh, before ischemic, before the ischemic period. So to quickly summarize, uh, we have found in this, throughout this research project that the activation of ASIC1A exacerbates cell death in cardiomyocytes, and that if we inhibit ASIC1A, we can provide a potent cardioprotection across multiple model systems. And we've shown this in clinically relevant models such as heart attack, as well as donor heart preservation, which I didn't discuss today, but if you're interested in how it might be applied to heart transplant, I'd be happy to discuss with anyone afterwards. And then more recently, of course, we've shown um, that it's potentially uh, it has potential efficacy as a post-conditioning agent, which is incredibly important when it, comes, when it comes to clinical translation in the future. And these are the many people who've made this project possible, but I won't go through in detail because I think I went a bit over time. <laughs> so I'm happy to hand off to Sonia now. We're probably back to Kamara, actually. Thank you, Meredith. That's fantastic. Um, both, I think, in the room and also online, we have um, some of our wonderful donors to the Institute who have actually dedicated funding towards the work of Professor King. And I think this is a, such a beautiful example of the continuation of those insights and the work that you're doing, Meredith, and with, with Nathan is really standing on the shoulders of what they were able to discover in those early stages of that research. And we tend to refer to that molecule 
molecule is the molecule that keeps on giving because the, the opportunities do rather seem quite boundless. Um, now it's my great pleasure to, I'm going to say the word pivot to our next um, opportunity. There, there's still a, there's still some heart to what we're about to hear from, but it's a very different vantage on the research that takes place in this building. And probably is a great example of why we bring these incredible minds into this building to be in the same space so that we can tackle these issues from all different directions. Um, but with that, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Sonia Shah, whose research focuses on the genetics of heart disease with two main goals. The first one is to understand which genes are important for the development of heart disease, which can help in turn develop new treatments. And the second is to use genetic information to predict who is more likely to be susceptible to this disease today and in the future. We have more time to make changes in our lifestyle, and then we can try and prevent disease from developing in the first place. Sonia is the recipient of the 2020 Genetic Society of Australasia Early Career Award. She's the 2020 Women in Technology Rising Star Award, and I'm, I'm not going to be shy about sharing when she took the Rising Star Award. A few people mentioned, well, I think that star is well and truly on its way. And in 2021, she's the Australian superstar in STEM, and um, very humble, but absolutely brilliant. I'm delighted to hand the microphone over to Sonia. Thanks, Kamira, and thank you everyone for this opportunity. It's really nice to be able to talk to other people about my research. Um, so as Kamira said, my research is really um, using genetic data to understand heart disease. So, you know, if something's broken and you want to fix it, you really need to understand how it works and what's gone wrong. So I use genetic data from thousands of individuals to try and understand what goes wrong in heart disease. And, and that gives us an idea of how we can actually prevent and treat disease. Um, so cardiovascular disease, as many of you will know, is still one of the major causes of death worldwide. So in Australia, there are, it affects more, um, more than 4 million Australians. Um, and these are statistics from the Heart Foundation, recent statistics, um, and saying that every day, um, one, per well, one person every 12 minutes is, it dies from cardiovascular disease. And it costs the Australian economy $5 billion every single year, more than any other disease. Um, but thankfully, over the last 10 years, the death rate from cardiovascular disease has been decreasing. And that really is thanks to research into, you know, our understanding of heart disease, what, is, what are the risk factors. And by knowing that, we can try and determine, you know, identify treatments and ways to prevent disease. So I want to show you this. Um, this is actually a, a report from a cardiology lab. It's an angiography report. So an angiography is where you inject the dye into the patient's blood vessels. Um, and then you do an x-ray and you can then see where if there are any blockages in the blood vessels that's preventing blood from flowing to and from the heart. So you can see for this particular patient, I don't know if my mouse works here. Yeah, for this particular patient, there are quite a few um, blood vessels that are blocked. Um, and one of the more worrying ones is here, the right coronary artery, which is one of the major arteries that supplies of the heart with oxygenated blood. And that's blocked, 99% blocked. So it's, this patient is not far from having a heart attack. Um, but thankfully, they underwent um, bypass surgery the next day. And I'm really thrilled and happy to report that they're alive and well. And the reason I'm really thrilled, because actually, this is my dad's report. <laughs> um, so he, my parents actually went to India on holiday, and they decided to have a health, full health check done, because it's a lot cheaper over there. They live in Kenya, so we don't have a great healthcare system. They were, you know, they, they went for a health check. He did a stress test, which is where they make you do some exercise and then look at how your heart rate varies. And they found that it was abnormal. So they sent him for an angiography. And the next day, he actually underwent surgery. So, you know, just, just goes to show he had no symptoms at all prior to this. So he had no idea this is what's happening inside him. Um, so this is just to stress that it's really important to go for your heart health check regularly, even if you're, you know, relatively young and fit. So when you do go to your GP, and I think everyone at the, from the age of 45 here in Australia can go for a heart, um, heart health check. What they do is they use a risk calculator. So they estimate your risk of getting heart disease within the next 10 years. And what goes into this risk calculator, um, lots of different risk factors. So you've got modifiable risk factors in green at the top, right? So you've got things like your BMI, your cholesterol levels, blood pressure. Are you a smoker? Do you have diabetes? 
Um, and then you've also got other risk factors, you know, like your diet and whether you drink a lot of alcohol, your physical inactivity, those don't particularly go into the risk factor, but we know that these are risk factors for heart disease. Um, and psychosocial factors as well. So more recently, we know that depression, for example, is also a risk factor for heart disease. And individuals with psychiatric disorders um, are twice more likely to have heart disease. Um, the other things that go into the risk calculator are some of the non-modifiable risk factors. So you've got your gender and your age. These are things you can't change, but the modifiable factors are things that you can change. So you can intervene um, by changing one of these risk factors. But what's interesting, oh, and it's not come up here, um, is that around 20% of patients who had, a, who had a heart attack for the first time, they don't have any of these risk factors. So if such a patient, like my dad, so my dad, yes, he was a diabetic and he was diagnosed with diabetes about six years prior to his surgery, but he was not a smoker or a drinker. He didn't have any of the traditional risk factors. And so if he had gone to his GP and the GP had done this risk calculation, then he wouldn't have been identified as somebody who's at high risk. And so he wouldn't have been put on any medication or any sort of intervention. Um, so there's obviously a gap in how well these calculators work. And we need to understand what else we can put into these calculators to make them more accurate. And one of the some of the factors that are non-modifiable that can go into it is your genetic makeup and your ancestry as well. So your ancestry, individuals with South Asian ancestry are more likely to suffer from heart disease and other, and other ancestries. So and that's obviously related to your genetics. So Currently, these calculators don't include that information. And a lot of my research so since my PhD is really focused on understanding what are the genes that contribute to disease and how, how we can use this information to improve these predictors. So um, I thought I'd just quickly touch on some of the work that I have published in the past. Um, so this is work actually I did in the UK when I was doing my PhD, and that's on the genetics of familial hypercholesterolemia. So this is a condition where you have very high levels of cholesterol, and individuals who have FH um, are more likely to have heart attack at a fairly younger age. Um, and so our study is actually, if you go to the NHS England website, it's actually referenced as a landmark study because it, it really shifted our understanding of how genetic contributes to this particular condition and as a result of the study in the UK they updated their health guidelines on how they manage patients who have FH. And another study that's more recent um, and that's on the genetics of heart failure. So heart failure is a condition where you just your heart is unable to pump enough blood to meet your body's demands and there is no effective treatment and the mortality rate is quite high so the five-year survival is only about 50% since from diagnosis. So this, we really sort of brought together international groups. We had over 30 different groups from around the world who had data on heart failure patients. We came together, we pooled all our data and conducted the largest ever study, um, genetic study of heart failure to date. And we had many industry partners who were in, interested in this because they want to develop new treatments for heart failure. So this is still ongoing research and we're, I'm still collaborating with this consortium. It's known as the Hermes Heart Failure Consortium. Um, and we're hoping to, you know, we've, we've already published one study which has uncovered some new biology about heart failure. But this is, you know, it's going to be um, quite a long-term goal to try and identify treatments for heart failure. Um, and in the future, I guess there are two um, projects that I'm really interested in. And um, the first is, you know, how do we, all this knowledge we've generated from doing genetic research, how can we actually integrate that into the healthcare system? Is it going to be useful to clinicians and patients? Um, and so I'm really collaborating with cardiologists at the Royal Brisbane Hospital to try and take this into their uh, clinic, uh, the heart clinic over there. Um, and the second topic that I'm interested in is actually understanding heart disease specifically in women. So women actually have lower prevalence of heart disease, but these, these calculators, these risk calculators are not very accurate for women. And so women who are at high risk are not being identified as high risk. So they're not getting the treatment and the intervention on time. And so my focus will really be about understanding the risk factors that are specific for women so that we can improve um, these risk calculators for women. Um, yeah, so that's really me. Um, thank you for listening. And thank you to my funders as well. I'm funded by the Heart Foundation and the National Health and Medical Research Council. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. That was absolutely incredible. And you wouldn't believe it. It's not the only thing she researches. This is an incredible um, program of complex traits. Did I get that right? Genomics? 
PT. Yeah. So um, under the, the guidance of um, the incredible Peter Vish and Naomi Ray, who are giants in the field of genetics, um, we have the next generation of leaders in this field coming through, just like Sonia. So thank you very much for making the time to share more with us firsthand. So with that, I'm, it's my delight to now invite someone up to the podium who also, we might be picking up the difference in accents here, hails not necessarily from right next door. Um, and it was um, thanks very much to, I, I think, a top up and whatnot that um, we have the delight of having Mark here at the Institute because he was certainly attracted to the calibre of research being pursued by Kate Schroeder and Matt Sweet and the team and the capacity to make an impact in the world of inflammation with what they were doing. So with that, Mark Milner is, I think, now in your third milestone. Um, so exciting times with your candidature for your PhD. Um, and as I mentioned, he works within the Schroeder group here at the Institute. During his undergraduate studies in biomedical science, he became increasingly interested in neurodegenerative diseases with a specific interest, of course, in Alzheimer's. Um, it is the most common neurodegenerative disease globally and is characterized by a loss of learning and memory, behavioral changes and motor dysfunction. Many clinical trials have been carried out in the last three decades in an attempt to find effective treatments for um, dementia. However, unfortunately, none have been successful. One aspect of um, Alzheimer's disease is that it's been frequently overlooked is in fact the inflammation. Age-related inflammation is a key characteristic of Alzheimer's disease, and yet we still do not fully understand how the inflammation may be causing the disease. Mark's research is actually focused on the inflazyme, which he'll share a bit more about that with you very shortly. And it's a protein for complex found in many of our immune cells and is a key player that contributes to the age-related inflammation that many, many people across the community experience. Through his PhD, Mark hopes to understand how inflammation drives Alzheimer's and ultimately identify the inflazyme as a potential therapy to target and do away with this despicable disease in the very near future. With that, Mark, I'll invite you up to the podium to share some of your exciting research firsthand. And um, I'm, I am going to mention, because they're going to see the before and after photo, this, this is what you look like when you come into research. This is how you look in your third milestone, <laughs> because we, we work you to the bone. <laughs> Thanks, Kamara. Um, yeah, next. Yes, so as Kamara said, my name is Mark and I work in uh, the Schroeder Group um, under Professor Kate Schroeder. And we're also known as the Inflammasome Lab and I'll go into exactly what that is in a second. So my project focuses on the Inflammasome, um, but in the aspect of neurodegeneration and Alzheimer's disease. Um, so very similar to what Kamara kind of just described, um, Alzheimer's disease is the most common neurodegenerative disease in the world at the moment. Um, so you've probably all heard of dementia, which is sort of uh, an umbrella term for any sort of neurodegenerative disease uh, that's characterized by a loss of learning and memory. Um, and so we can say that there's many diseases that fall under the umbrella of dementia. And uh, Alzheimer's disease makes up 80% of those cases. So it's a huge chunk. Um, other remaining cases would be Parkinson's disease, um, Huntington's disease, things like that. And um, so I just wanted, what I wanted to show you here was just kind of the difference between uh, if you looked at the, the brain sample of a young and healthy brain compared to someone who had uh, advanced Alzheimer's disease, um, just in terms of uh, decrease in volume, loss of brain tissue, and this can manifest in many clinical uh, sim symptoms and signs, such as loss of learning and memory, uh, behavioral abnormalities, as well as sometimes motor dysfunction. Um, and one area of the brain that I just wanted to bring to your attention, because I don't know, I think it it's an area of the brain that like looks pretty cool in my opinion, um, but it's also really important is this bit here and it's called the hippocampus. And this regulates our ability to um, remember things and to learn new skills and everything like that. And this is the primary uh, center of the brain, Ooh, where's my mask on, there we go, uh, that is uh, affected uh, in Alzheimer's disease specifically. However, despite us 
having probably I think first discovered Alzheimer's disease about 100 years ago um, and actively working uh, towards finding a cure uh, majorly in the last 30 to 40 years, um, we unfortunately still do not have any effective treatments or preventative measures for this disease and we still don't really understand fully what's happening. Um, so what I wanted to show you here was just kind of um, a summary of uh, the kind of drugs that are in development and in different clinical trials at the moment. So this was from 2019. Um, this is not unlike a similar figure that shows the amount of drugs that have failed clinical trials over the last 20 to 30 years. Um, so it's great that we're working towards these new molecules, but unfortunately we still haven't, you know, had a breakthrough drug that's able to either prevent or treat the disease itself. Um, and the reason for that, I suppose, or I suppose in our lab, why we think that is, is because out of all of these drugs that we can see here, um, none of them address a major uh, part of the disease, which is the neuroinflammation and the inflammation we see in aging, as well as in neurodegenerative disease itself. And so that's where I come into it, basically, and where I'm most interested is a lot of the drugs at the moment uh, focus on these two other aspects of, the, of Alzheimer's disease, this formation of these uh, large protein clumps that form in the brain, and they're called amyloid plaques. Um, and the other one is these, uh, they're also protein clumps in fairness, but they're inside cells, uh, and they're called neurofibrillary tangles. And so the previous slide that I showed you with all those drugs are focusing on trying to clear these protein clumps and get rid of the protein. Um, and a lot of them have been successful in clinical trials and have been able to decrease uh, the protein load within the brain, but it unfortunately hasn't translated to any uh, cognitive improvement. So people are still getting worse. Um, their memory and their, and their ability to learn is still decreasing over time, uh, despite us being able to treat the protein part of it successfully. And so in the last, I would say, 10 years or so, uh, there's really been a shift into looking at the, the neuroinflammation, which is a huge um, factor in the disease. And in particular, as I alluded to earlier, um, in probably the last five years, this protein uh, or this protein complex called the inflammasome has really come to the forefront as a potential therapeutic target uh, within Alzheimer's disease and many other chronic diseases as well. So what is the inflammasome? It's a protein complex. It's found in a lot of our immune cells within the body. Um, and essentially, it's really important for uh, fighting infection and any kind of sterile injury, tissue damage, um, and kind of releasing a lot of inflammation, either clearing the infection or um, help uh, improve the injury. And then the in in inflammation decreases. It goes back to normal levels, and we move on, and we're all healthy, and we're all good. The problem is that with age particularly, uh, the inflammasome can be turned on and then it doesn't really turn off. And so it constantly produces this chronic inflammation within the body. And what we think is that this chronic inflammation may be driving forward a lot of diseases, and in this particular case, Alzheimer's disease, um, particularly when it's found in the brain. So the main thing that we focused on with this um, or, or why I kind of I'm focusing on the inflammasome and in, Al, in Alzheimer's is that these two papers that I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with them, but I just wanted to point out, um, show that when you take an Alzheimer's model and you remove the inflammasome, you can genetically remove it, and that it actually pre prevented uh, disease onset and the cognitive decline that we see uh, in both aspects of those amyloid plaques that I was talking about, which are here in green. So we can see that there's a decrease in the amount of green plaques that we see, as well as here, these are the neurofibrillary tangles that are found within cells. And when we remove the inflammasome, we have a decrease in this. And this was really exciting. This was a maybe uh, five or five years ago, uh, five or seven years ago, that these kind of papers were coming out to really suggest that this inflammation is the thing that is driving forward the disease. Um, however, we still don't fully understand how it's doing it. And that's where my project comes in, is what are the molecular mechanisms that are actually allowing the inflammasome to drive the inflammation? And how is that inflammation then driving the neurodegenerative diseases that we see like Alzheimer's and another PhD student in our lab is also working on uh, Parkinson's disease and it's involved in loads of different diseases. Um, so that's essentially what I'm trying to do is look at the molecular mechanisms 
And the reason for that is it's a very busy pathway and I don't want you to take in more than just the fact that this is a lot of stuff that we can look at in terms of this pathway. There's a lot of different proteins, there's a lot of different uh, pro-inflammatory molecules. And so there's a lot of different aspects of where we can target it therapeutically and either inhibit or um, basically prevent or inhibit it to prevent the inflammation that we see within the brain and hopefully ultimately be able to uh, treat Alzheimer's disease successfully as well as potentially prevent the onset itself. Um, and so, yeah, that's just a summary of my project where we're looking at the, infl uh, the inflammasome, the release of pro-inflammatory uh, molecules and how this can maybe affect uh, other processes that are driving Alzheimer's forward. I think that's it. Yes, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> I was like, I couldn't remember how many slides. Go. Thank you, Mark. That's wonderful. Did anybody else see a map of the Brisbane roadways there and what happens when it starts to rain and one, one artery changes? Um, oh, that was a stunning presentation. I think that really identifies that inflammation essentially is your best friend and it's your biggest foe. And I think fantastic that this next researcher is following you because it's another take in terms of how inflammation really can be the precursor to such despicable diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, but also how it's interacting with our bodies in the event of um, viruses as well. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce our last but not least researcher. Nobody actually took out the baton of least, by the way. Um, Larissa, Larissa, Larissa. When people were running away from COVID, she was running towards it. So 2020 and 2021 have been um, some very big years of research and collaboration and, and growing your work in a completely different area that wasn't anticipated. And that would be because Larissa is an immunologist who studies the immune system and essentially looking at how we fight off viruses and infections. And so she joined IMB in 2019 and really had to hit the ground running. Um, so she looks at influenza and the more official name for the COVID-19 disease, which is SARS-CoV-2 and how that triggers inflammation. Um, inflammation is the host's first response to infection and is needed for an effective immune response. However, too much inflammation can cause the disease. Larissa uses immunological genetic and imaging techniques to understand how influenza and SARS-CoV-2 interact with our innate immune cells to trigger inflammation. Larissa's research aims to uncover new therapeutic approaches for treating acute viral infections like COVID-19 and flu and to develop better vaccines and antivirals. And I think more recently you've had some success with a paper that identifies um, the advent of what's going on with cardiovascular systems. So it's in in the face of COVID-19. So it's my great pleasure to hand over to Larissa for the final presentation. Keep those questions at the ready. We're getting there. Thanks, Kamara. Um, well, Kamara has given me a really great introduction. And um, I mean, I don't think that either flu or COVID really need an introduction, but I guess, um, so when I came back to the IMB, I'm, I'm from Queensland, as you can tell, probably <laughs> the only one with a bona fide Australian accent here. And I was fortunate enough to do my undergrad, but also my initial research life here at the IMB. Um, and then I went overseas to do my PhD and a postdoc. And as Kamara mentioned, I came back in 2019. And um, I joined the lab that Mark is working in, which is really about um, inflammation, as he suggested. And I guess a lot of the time we look at, at inflammation, we think of it as a bad thing. You know, we're always after anti-inflammatories. You know, if you've got like swelling and sore legs or, you know, um, chronic inflammation is an ongoing problem. And something that we sort of easily forget about is how important it is in fighting off infectious diseases. Um, and I guess that's where, you know, my interest really came in because I've always found viruses quite fascinating. And in 2019, I was like, I'm going to work on influenza because it's it's an ongoing problem. Um, probably the biggest pandemic, maybe not in anyone in this room's living memory. Um, I'm sure there's still someone out there it was the 1918 uh, Spanish flu. Um, and we think that it actually killed more people than in World War One um, and potentially World War Two combined. So. 
We'll never really know the true number of people who caught the Spanish flu or who died from the Spanish flu. Um, needless to say, it was pretty devastating. And um, obviously we've all been affected by COVID. Um, these were the numbers from today. It's been pretty sad. Um, the number of times I've given presentations about COVID and really all the way from March 2020 and just the numbers climbing um, each time I give it. So, you know, it's, it's a pretty serious disease. And what we really try and understand is, well, you know, why, why do people get sick from these viruses and how can we stop that? So I, as Kamara mentioned, I'm an immunologist. So really, um, as far as I'm concerned, everything comes down to the immune system. So we get challenged by like viruses and bacteria and things all the time, but we don't get sick because we have really strong immune systems. And, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a Goldilocks situation, of course, with everything, you know, we want it to be just right. So if we, if we get it just right, if I use it here, usually we'll eliminate the virus. So, you know, if we get infected, we'll get rid of it. We won't have it anymore, we're no longer infectious. Or maybe we'll have the virus all the time, but we're able to survive. So this might be some chronic infections. Or my other sort of favourite description of it is that we'll be infected all the time, but we won't be sick. So actually, bats are kind of a really good example of that. They're viral reservoirs. They carry all these viruses, but it doesn't really seem to bother them that much. But what we know happens, of course, is that lots of people get very, very sick and they're susceptible. I mean, 5 million deaths worldwide from COVID. And we really think that what has happened with the immune response, because it's, you know, really key at fighting off these viruses. So viruses are kind of funny in, you know, people debate as to whether they're alive or not. They essentially need to get inside your cells in order to replicate. So they're inert outside, but then they get into our cells. They use all of our cellular machinery um, to make more copies of themselves. So our immune system works by essentially trying to stop the virus from getting inside our cells. So it uses um, sort of these antibodies, which I like to think of as like handcuffs that stop the virus from being able to unlock the door to get inside our cells. And we also have these other immune cells that can come along and kill an infected cell. So imagine if your virus has turned your kind of house into a viral factory, it'd be like something coming along and specifically bombing that viral factory so that we really protect the whole organism. Yes, you'd have to sacrifice one cell, but it's for the greater good of everyone else. So, you know, when the immune system is working well, it's great. And it's able to usually um, completely get rid of the, the pathogen, or maybe it doesn't work that well, but it's not causing too much damage. And so we're able to live with the virus. So when we get it right, so just right, Goldilocks, that's when, you know, we're protected from infection. And actually that's how vaccines work. A vaccine is only ever as good as your immune response. And remember all vaccines are, are essentially trying to trick your immune system into thinking that they've seen the virus before. So you're, you're showing the immune system a little bit of the virus so it can make all the weaponry in advance so that we've got a head start against fighting the virus. So what I'm really interested in is the other end of the spectrum, the sort of, you know, <laughs> either the too little or the too much part of the response. So if our immune system doesn't work at all, we don't make those weaponries, the virus can sort of, you know, replicate out of control. It takes up all of our nutrients, uses all of our resources, and then we can't survive. But on the other hand, if we have too much of an immune response, um, that also causes a lot of disease. And I'm, I'm gonna talk about that a bit more because that's what I'm particularly interested in. So we think of it a bit like collateral damage. If you have, you know, those, those bombers taking out those viral factories, if they're starting to take out cells that aren't infected by the virus or too many, then you're, you know, you're gonna lose all the factories and, and the, the infrastructure in your body needed to have normal function. So we need to really keep that under control as well. And it needs to be functioning at that right level. So I actually work right at the at the front line of it. So in my in my analogy, if you imagine, um, you know, you're in your house and and someone breaks in, so that's the same as a virus getting into one of your cells in your lung that mediates that gas exchange. So you breathe in oxygen, breathe out carbon dioxide, and that's where the virus likes to infect. So they've got some kind of, you know, weaponry. <laughs> they they might be like you or me, right? If someone breaks into the house, you might 
try and fight them off, but probably not. More likely you're gonna ring the police, you're like, help. <laughs> um, so the cells that I work on are called macrophages. And I think of them as like the policemen of the body because they can come in, they've got, you know, more powers and more um, nuance to pick up sort of more information. They're kind of like detectives. So they can work out a bit better what kind of invader it is, um, how we might fight it off. And either they can try and uh, eliminate it themselves or they bring in bigger guns. And so these cells, they release all these chemical um, communicators called cytokines that essentially are the communication lines throughout the body. So they send out these signals. And two of the major sets of signals they send out, so again, this is my <laughs> detection, are these pro-inflammatory ones. So this signals to the rest of the immune systems to say, hey, we've got something here in the lung. Can you please make some antibodies? We're gonna need some of those um, T cells to take out those virus infected cells, um, get over here now. And that's, you know, when you, when you're feeling sick and you've got sore muscles and you've got a fever, you're feeling really tired, that's all those molecules circulating throughout your body and your immune system starting to work up. The other thing they do is essentially they tell the neighboring cells how to fight off the virus. So it's like giving a set of instructions and saying, okay, here's how to protect yourself and arm yourself and fight everyone off. We call these like interferon stimulated genes. So we've got this real pro-inflammatory response and this really antiviral response. And we know in COVID, and in fact, in most other diseases from, from genetic studies, for instance, that if you lack some of those receptors and if you can't get those responses right, or if you have more of one than of the other, that's when you get severely ill. So if you don't make this interferon response, you're really likely to get severe COVID. If you make too much of this pro-inflammatory response, you get too much of that damage and you end up, it ends up that your immune system starts killing your your own cells and then you can't breathe properly anymore. So what I particularly want to know is, so how do, how do our macrophages, how do they see the virus and how do they decide what kind of signals they need to send out? And I really think about it as in, we have a whole system of alarms almost in our cells. Um, so the inflammasome that Mark works on, that's one kind of a cellular alarm that we have. And you know, we have different types of alarms. So we might have smoke alarms, might have a car alarm, um, you know, other types of alarms, sort of heat alarms, depending on, on the situation you're in, of course. Um, and they're all really important, but, you know, and we need them to be functioning properly. But say, you know, you've, you've got a fire already and you're dealing with it. Um, and then that smoke alarm keeps going off and it just keeps going and it keeps going. So either it keeps bringing in more fire trucks to the place, even though one would be enough to deal with it, Maybe that starts clogging up other things, creating a whole mess that um, you can't really deal with. Maybe that's just really annoying to deal with and it keeps going on and it's broken all the time. And, and instead of, you know, how do you deal with a smoke alarm when you burnt some toast? Do you, do you try and like block your ears? Ideally, you just want to switch it off, right? And, and not have it sense the toast that's um, burning. Um, ideally, you just want it to go off in terms of a fire. You might be like me and you might rip it out of the wall because you, <laughs> you can't reach it properly. Um, and when we think of how to treat viral infections, it's, it's kind of the same when it comes to our immune system being overactive. We really think that there's a broken alarm. We wanna understand which alarms are broken and why, and how can we fix them? We don't wanna rip it out from the wall because we need it to be functioning to help us fight off any other kind of infection. Um, but we also don't wanna just you know, block our ears and ignore the noise, because again, then we might miss other important things that are going on. We wanna just fix the alarm. And that's really what my research is trying to do. So again, just to sort of bring back how I really think about when the immune system is overactive in COVID and also in the flu is I really think about it like, like collateral damage and sort of, you know, uh, civilian destruction and, and sort of bombing in the, in the war. So what I've shown here is really, um, you know, what we think of as the lung and this is your blood vessels. And these are the cells that, that help you breathe in the gas so the oxygen and breathe out the CO2. And what happens in COVID is that these cells get infected by the virus, but then your immune cells come along. And if they start um, breaking down that barrier, first of all, we lose all the cells that can actually do that important job of helping us breathe. But also they form a barrier with the outside world. And we start getting fluid leaking into that airspace. So not only are we suffocating, but then we start to drown in our own fluid. And our immune cells are also trying to sort of patch up 
that area too. So we sort of start forming scar tissue, this fibrosis, and that ends up making it even harder for us to breathe as well. So what we want to do is try and try and prevent this immune overactivation. Um, and we know that that works because if you end up hospitalized with COVID, so, you know, you've probably been infected for a, a week or more, what we know is that targeting the virus itself with antivirals, which is very important, is very useful, um, but it's no longer really useful when you're in hospital. The thing that works best is an immunosuppressant, so calming down that overactive immune response. But again, it's not perfect. It's not working well. We know we've got huge um, shortages of that kind of immunosuppressant now. We need it for other inflammatory diseases too. So we're trying to find better ways. And we're also trying to make sure that we don't make people susceptible to secondary infections. And that's a big problem with flu. So you, often if you get the flu, and I'm sure you all know this, you might get a secondary bacterial infection. And that's because your immune system is weakened from trying to fight off the virus. So it, we're trying to work out how to, how to get it back on track. So um, I think I've tried to, to tell you most of these things too. We're also um, really looking at the symptoms of long COVID. So trying to understand what actually causes that so that we can treat it better. Um, Kamara alluded to it there. Um, we've just done some exciting work looking at how COVID causes vascular dysfunction. So we know with people who get COVID, they actually get a lot of blood clots and they're starting to have problems with more heart attacks and strokes. Um, and we're trying to understand why that is. And we really think it's down to that inflammation, again, causing our blood vessels to start sort of throwing out these blood clots to try and control the infection. But it's not working. So we're going to try and find out better ways to, to help that. Um, you know, as, as Sonia mentioned, we're trying to understand why do people react so differently to this virus, right? Um, we know that there are certain risk factors with, with COVID and certainly for flu, the, the older you are, the more likely you are to get severely ill. Um, but, you know, there are certainly a whole host of other what we call comorbidities, so things that might make you more sick. So why is that? Um, what, how does that affect the immune system and how can we kind of overcome that then? And, you know, ultimately it's really down to being prepared for the next pandemic. So, you know, we like to think about if we can develop treatments that stop our immune system being overactive, that's going to help us when there's going to be inevitably another pandemic. Uh, I hate to sort of bring that up, but it, it's likely to happen. And I, I just wanted to finish with, um, so I work with the virus. Um, we have a special physical containment level three facility. Um, and as you can imagine, working with COVID is not trivial. And so we have to wear a special PPE as you can see there, and I wear a nice papa um, so that I'm protected from the virus. Um, but it, it means that it's, you know, there are only a few of us here on campus who can do it. Um, we're very excited here at the IMB. We've just built a new PC3. So that means that we're able to do more COVID research here in the building. Um, but it also means we're able to do research on more dangerous pathogens, so things that cause other um, pretty pretty cool diseases and that we're more prepared, you know, for the next inevitable, inevitable pandemic, sort of much more so than we were for this one. Um, so thank you all for listening. And with that, I'll hand back to Gamira. Thank you very much for that, Larissa. Um, ladies and gentlemen, can you join me in giving a round of applause to these incredible researchers as each of them moves up to take a seat over here for us? So I absolutely love telling people that I work for the Institute for Molecular Bioscience. It is, in my mind, a box full of solutions to the world's hairiest problems. And um, then they say, wow, you, you must be really smart. And I say, no, just the people I work with. Um, but I think you'll agree with me that we've had a collection of four incredible research projects today to hear more about. And for me, on a personal basis, I have a grandmother who had a triple bi pass and never really recovered from that and we lost her um, so heart disease is particularly something that I'm passionate about I've had family members who had COVID um, so the work that Larissa and her colleagues is doing is just phenomenal and my worst fear is that my daughter will have a conversation with me one day and I won't know who she is so thank you Mark for what you do with that, I hope to hear that there's some fantastic questions down in the Q&A. We have um, Shona from the team here overseeing it online. But I'm going to kick off with a question for each of you here. And then I'll ask that you put your hands up for me when you're in the, in the room so that I know that you're interested in making a question. 
But I'd love to hear from each of you what inspires you each day to do what you do. We haven't heard from you in a while, there. Um, yeah, so, well, when I first got into science, the thing that inspired me the most was just learning how the heart worked. I found the fact that it pumps continuously all day long to be fascinating. It never runs out of energy. It never gets tired. And it just is forced to continually do this important work in order for us to be able to live our lives. Um, and that was essentially why I got into research. And honestly, that continues to be what inspires me to this day. I'm just fascinated to learn sort of on a molecular level how that translates to global function, us walking around talking and doing big scale things. But on a molecular level, there's all sorts of things going on that we just don't understand and that we can't see with our eyes. But with you know the scientific research that we do here at the IMB with advanced imaging techniques, et cetera, we can actually see those processes happening in real time. And I just find that fascinating. Well, I think like Meredith, um, I've just, as, as a child in school, I loved science. Biology is my favorite subject. And I think I've always been curious about how the body works. Um, but I, you know, that curiosity then has just driven me to pursuing this research career. But I think what really gets me motivated is trying to make a difference. Um, you know, if I can, yeah, make a different an impact um, to, you know, every, everybody's health, that's really what drives me every day. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm sort of the same. I, I just find it really fascinating <laughs> what happens with the immune system and and yeah how does it actually see these invisible things and how does it respond in that way how does the immune system protect us and and how does it go wrong um so I, I'm, I'm driven very much by pure fascination with the science um but certainly I mean these past two years have been really exhausting but you know being able to feel like what you know asking these important questions. And I've been fortunate enough to do quite a bit of um, outreach to, you know, we've really understood how little we know about the immune system actually, and how little we understand about viruses and how critical that is, you know, to develop vaccines that are gonna save lives, um, treatments, all of these things. Um, and I think that's been a real driver to try and work out what's going wrong and hopefully, you know, develop something that is gonna save lives eventually. I'm going to be very boring and say the same thing <laughs> in the sense of, yeah, it's, it's really just the, um, the intrigue of trying to understand what's going on, particularly obviously with Alzheimer's disease and neurodegeneration and inflammation and kind of if I can contribute in some way towards our understanding and knowledge within the field, I just think that would be really cool. <laughs> um, and I think by contributing and driving the field forward, you know, ultimately helping people at the other end and seeing some sort of outcome within society um, would be obviously the ultimate goal. Um, I think on top of that as well, something that does drive me forward is by doing my PhD or, or learning as much as I can to go out and do things like this and talk to just anyone outside of science um, of any age to try and get them more interested or inspired by work that we do here in the IMB or, or just science in general and start asking questions and looking up things themselves. Um, because I don't know, I just think even though I, I look at Alzheimer's and neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative diseases, I think uh, like all aspects of science are super interesting and cool. And if other people that I can talk to kind of get involved through like through something that I've said, I think that's really something that does really inspire me to keep going as well. Thank you very much. Now, I, I believe we have not received a question on the Q&A online as yet. Does somebody in the room have a question you would like to put to the panel? Yes, sir. Well, uh, thank you. They've been, I've read a couple of reports in the, in the media recently about two new drugs, which are seeking regulatory approval, which on the sound of it sound phenomenally effective in preventing severe COVID disease. So the question is, do you guys know about this? Do you know how they work? And, and what do you think about it? Welcome to the restrictions of funding. We have one microphone. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I think they're very exciting developments. So I think that the more weapons we have in our arsenal to fight off this virus, the better. So the reality is, and I mean, you know, the fact that we're sort of having boosters being rolled out now and we're, we're going to feel it in Queensland sort of very soon, which is very exciting. Um, but 
you know, this this virus is here in such a huge amount that we need all the weapons we can get to fight it off. So these antivirals are super exciting. Um, so the two antivirals work in two different ways. Um, I think of them a bit like antibiotics almost. They, they really interrupt with the virus. So the first one is the Merck one. Um, so the virus has to replicate itself. So it almost has its like own photocopier, right, to make copies of itself. And I really think of the Merck drug as being like something that jams that photocopier. So it stops it from being able to copy itself and, and make new variants, make new progeny. Um, and the Pfizer drug, um, it works by, um, so the virus also has almost like its own pair of scissors. So, you know, it kind of... Um, has has its copy of, of its genome that it then has to to cut into the right shapes um, to sort of make its functional virus and proteins and so it has its own set of scissors um, that it encodes and the Pfizer drug it actually works to sort of really block those scissors so both of these drugs work to stop the virus from replicating so it's super important but again um, it's going to be most useful really early on in infection so either you know, right after you've had a positive COVID test, maybe before you feel any symptoms, that'll be the best time to get those drugs. So where it might be really useful is um, to sort of prevent people from developing the virus if they've been exposed to it. So what you can imagine is like someone tests positive in a household and maybe then the rest of the household will get those antivirals to sort of help. And hopefully if we can, you know, get people, get those drugs into the people soon enough, they'll be able to prevent Lyme's. Uh, prevent deaths, sorry, or hospitalizations. But I guess a lot of the problem is, you know, certainly for me anyway, um, maybe what happens is, you know, maybe you'll have a sniffle and you'll be like, is it COVID? <laughs> I might wait and see. Um, <laughs> will, will I get better? Will I be fine? You know, I'm, I'm young. Why wouldn't, I should be okay. Um, and the potential is that we might wait too long and we'll miss that, that therapeutic window in which to use those antivirals. So I think they're incredibly important, but I think we need other alternatives and other backups. And I guess the other problem is, so this virus mutates a lot. Um, well actually, it doesn't in comparison to like HIV and flu, but it's just when there's so much of it around, um, the opportunity for it to, to gain new mutations and to make variants, so we, we've seen that happen all the time now, um, I guess is really increased. And the more it spreads, the more opportunities there are for that. And we're worried about resistance to the vaccines emerging. Um, we'd similarly be worried about resistance to these antivirals emerging. So it might just, you know, again, the more weapons we can have in our arsenal, the better. Um, so it's, it's definitely an exciting time for antivirals, though. Thank you, Larissa. And such an important point, given um, before our eyes all turned to COVID, we were already very worried about the emergence of antimicrobial resistance and the superbugs that are out there. And that is not an issue that's disappeared either in the last two years. In fact, the environment is probably now set to compound that issue. But we have a question here. Thank you. Uh, well, I think uh, COVID is a hot topic at the moment. So my question is in relation to vaccines. Like I've heard many people uh, wondering if like vaccines uh, expire, like many of us had our vaccines earlier in the year. And now, like, especially here in Queensland that we have been like um, out of COVID pretty much. And now that the borders are opening and yeah, there will definitely be more cases now. And like, there's this worry, will my vaccine will still be effective enough? Do we need the booster? What does the booster do? Uh, who needs it? Yeah, that would be my question. I'm going to give it to Larissa unless anybody else wants to take the big, the big C question. <laughs> um, that's a really important question. So the reason we get boosters is because um, fortunately our immune system and we think it's more, so we consider innate and adaptive and we, we think about our adaptive immune system as the cells that make those antibodies and that make those killer T cells. And what's really cool about them is that they, they actually um, can specifically recognize part of COVID and they'll be able to distinguish, sorry, SARS-CoV-2, and they, they're they totally different. They wouldn't be able to recognize influenza. They wouldn't be able to recognize a bacteria. They're super specific for SARS-CoV-2. So um, what happens is, you know, when we first get infected or if we get the vaccine, we make heaps of those antibodies and we make heaps of those T cells that are super specific for SARS-CoV-2. But then when the sort of the threat goes away, 
you know, we don't need all of those antibodies and we don't need all of those T cells around and they cost energy to the body to make and to maintain. And, you know, also that we've only got so much blood if it was full of all these different types of antibodies and then we're keeping them all the time, you know, it'd be super thick. So um, we kind of lose them a bit, but we don't lose the, the information of how to make them. We sort of keep that on file. When we see that second time, the immune system is like, oh, that threat's back again. I've got to make more of these and I've got to make them better because obviously what I did the first time wasn't good enough. So we actually make both more antibodies and T cells and we make better versions of them. So we improve both quantity and quality. And so with a vaccine, each time you get a booster, that's essentially what's happening. So it's a really good question about the waning immunity. And we, to be honest, as immunologists, we still don't really understand you know, why that is. It kind of tracks that it would make sense that you, you know, you wouldn't have so many circulating antibodies around, but we still have those B cells around that can make the antibodies again. It's just that they're not right at hand. So what we're seeing with the vaccines is, you know, after six months, they're no longer able to necessarily prevent you from being infected. So testing positive for the virus. What they're able to protect you from is getting severely sick, so ending up in hospital or dying from the virus. They're still really good at that. And I think that comes down to the fact that our immune system is still at an advantage over the virus. We don't have, you know, those immediate weaponry there, those blocks right there, but we're much quicker at making them. So we're able to sort of catch the virus before we get really, really ill. So the boosters are going to be important and maybe we'll have to keep having them because we'll want to keep, you know, we still don't want people like taking time, you know, being sick with a, a cold or a serious cold, um, you know, needing time off work. Ultimately, we'd, we'd be fine. Um, but I guess it's going to be a bit of a, a wait and see to how many boosters we might need to have, how long it's going to keep going. Maybe three is the magic number. Um, unfortunately, we don't know. Not unlike how we've moved as a society to be getting our flu shot every year, which is a, it changes year on year. So it's something also very important. I do understand we have a question online. Thank you. So thanks to Colin Ingram on our, from our online audience. Um, it's sort of the next stage on it really from what you just said, Larissa. The research on the COVID vaccine by the University of Queensland ceased for the current pandemic. However, is the research continuing for booster shots and better vaccines here? Is that necessarily something that we can comment in terms of the breadth of research being undertaken at the Institute at the moment? Yeah. Yeah, we might circle that. Great question, Colin. Thank you very much. But we might circle back to that. Um, oh, of course, you're on the other side. Great. Um, coming to the, our wonderful audience member now who has a question. I'm not quite sure who this question is for. It could be Mark, it could be one of the others. Um, I'm intrigued by the fact that it's the elderly people who you might think had a more compromised immune system are falling sick of COVID more than younger people. But why was it the opposite? Or well, not exactly the opposite, but why was it different in the 1923 when epidemic? All right, this is the last one for Larissa and then we're going to share the fun. <laughs> that is true. Um, great question. Um, and we, we don't know is the short answer, but yeah, you're right. It's really fascinating. Um, and actually that's, that's where it's interesting too with flu compared to COVID. So with flu, we know it's kind of like a, a U shape in terms of the really young. So infants are really likely to be susceptible to flu or severe disease from flu and, and the elderly. And fortunately with COVID, what we've seen is it's really the young are protected um, and the elderly are more likely to get severe COVID. And with the, the 1918 flu, it was a strange W-shaped curve. So there was a real peak in, in young people who we consider to be sort of peak healthy um, around, you know, I think it was sort of around 28. And so there are multiple kind of um, hypotheses as to why that might be. So some of the thoughts is that, you know, maybe when those kids who, who ended up being sort of 28 around 1918, so I guess they were born probably about like, 1890 or something maybe the first flu strain they encountered was actually the Russian flu and so they almost had like 
the wrong kind of immunity. Um, <laughs> so flu is a different one and I could talk for ages about it, but we don't really understand. I guess there was also World War One raging at the time or it just ended. And these are more likely to be, you know, soldiers, nurses, people who are on the ground who are actually in contact potentially with the virus going around. Um, there's also theories that maybe uh, a measles epidemic had kind of preceded that. And what we've just learned is that measles actually wipes a lot of your immune memory. So if you kind of had protection from, you know, previous flu infections. So sort of that um, immunity built up from previous infections. If you'd had measles, it might've wiped all of that clear. So maybe that's why they were getting sick with it. To be honest, we don't know, and we might never know, but we, we're still trying to find out. <laughs> Thank you very much, Larissa. And of course, um, the, the trenches and the poverty that was raging internationally on the back of that was um, the perfect blending zone for all of that to occur. I'm going to redirect this on purpose to the wonderful Sonia Shah. The, the landscape of genomics has absolutely changed at a shotgun pace in the last 20 years. And so with population health and the predictive measures that you're looking at versus coming up with preventative solutions, if we were to have a solution in the future where the gene that is driving a lot of the degeneration of the heart is no longer in the system, what sort of crystal ball of time are we looking at? So, so with heart disease, um, so you know, cardiovascular disease is a really an umbrella term for lots of different types of disease related to the heart and the vascular system. Um, and so the most common diseases like coronary artery disease, heart attacks, it's not a single gene that's causing these diseases. It is hundreds of genes and there's small changes in your DNA that increase your risk slightly of getting heart disease. So each single change can't cause disease by itself. But if you have loads of these changes in your DNA, you have a much higher risk of getting heart disease. So it is you know, it's not just having a single treatment um, that's targeting a single gene, it can help. But, you know, this is really the, the, the way genetic, genetics will be used at, at a population health level is really trying to identify those indiv individuals early enough so we can start making those changes in your lifestyle or starting medication to actually just prevent disease happening from in the first place. So you're essentially going to tell me to address my consumption of alcohol, aren't you? <laughs> We do have a question in the middle here. Thank you. My question was for Meredith. I was wondering um, how far off therapies might be, you know, from being put in use from the work that you're doing or the work that you're involved in. Wonderful question because she's very humble up here on the panel, but her research is probably some of the furthest down the pipeline, which is fantastic. Yes, that's a really good question. So. Um, I guess the, the short answer is I don't completely know. It's a definitely a long road from discovery to translation, but we are currently in the process of sort of establishing some our plans for our maybe initial phase one clinical trial um, and sort of trying to push it into a human population as soon as we possibly can. And that'll first involve um, doing some safety studies where we're not necessarily looking at efficacy, but just confirming that it's safe uh, to deliver to humans. And then from there, we'd then go on to do a first sort of effic efficacy study. Um, so definitely we're still several years out from doing those sorts of those sorts of studies, but hopefully not too far in the future. And since I've got the microphone, I might just say that um, in relation to what Sonia was just talking about as well, how there's many, many, many genes that contribute to cardiovascular disease. That's actually one of the reasons why there's been such a sort of roadblock in terms of finding drugs that can protect the heart is that you find a new target and you find a drug that blocks it, but then when you actually go to use it in the human population, which is so diverse with a range of, you know, comorbidities, age, all sorts of factors that can influence their response to the, to the drug or the disease. Um, and then ultimately we just lose that efficacy in large human populations. Um, so one of the things that we try and look at is can we find targets that are sort of upstream of multiple processes, which has a greater, hope, hopefully anyway, a greater likelihood of actually translating to success in the human population. And if I'm correct in understanding the, the Palpant group of which you're a critical representative, there's several candidates that you're reviewing as a, as a group. So that's really exciting. Yes, the HA1A is definitely the furthest along, but we have a couple of other sort of preliminary targets that are still very much in the discovery phase. <laughs> uh, and do you actually have to touch the spiders? Everybody wants to know. 
No, so actually what's what's great is that once we have our peptide or candidate of choice, we can actually produce them uh, recombinantly. So we don't have to um, actually extract venom in order to produce the drug, which is obviously very beneficial. Um, and in, in the Palpin group, we primarily study the heart. So the other targets that we're looking at are more, um, you know, targets that we've identified from genetic screens and that sort of thing. And then once we confirm that they might work, then we then the next step is to go on and find drugs that actually um, target those targets. <laughs> So that's a really good point. One of the greatest challenges, I think, in those initial days was the scalability of um, the molecule. And it was actually um, the, the philanthropy that we received from the broader community that helped Glenn with that challenge and then enabled the work that you and Nathan have been doing. So even in those earlier stages, people have the capacity to create change in partnership with you. Did I see your hand up? Um, can I just ask Mark a question, please? Um, Mark, the, uh, the picture that you sort of put up with the young brain and with the brain that was affected by Alzheimer's, I read somewhere that you can only sort of do that in a post-mortem to, to see um, the impact of Alzheimer's. Is, is that right? Or are there other ways that you can, you can check the, the level of Alzheimer's? Thank you. <laughs> This is good for my preventative measures, right? Uh, yeah, no, great question. So um, up until a couple of years ago, um, that was the case where you could only really fully diagnose Alzheimer's disease post-mortem. Um, and it was to do with the fact that you'd have to take the brain slice and stain it for those protein plaques that I described earlier. Um, and we weren't able to actually detect this through any sort of scans. Um, over the last few years with um, an increase in the ability of um, like PET scans and ultrasounds and things like that, we've been able to um, kind of fluorescently tag uh the protein plaques in it, like actually in a living person and so it's kind of gotten better there's still ways to go but it's gotten much better at detecting and being able to diagnose alzheimer's successfully because before you were just given the diagnosis of dementia and that was what you were diagnosed with and there wasn't very many specific treatments for dementia well there still isn't but at the time you were just put on whatever drug they think kind of worked to mask your symptoms. And then it was only um, once you had passed away and they did a postmortem that they were able to fully diagnose you with Alzheimer's disease. But we're moving towards um, and have a few techniques now that we're able to actually look at in, in a living person, whether they have Alzheimer's or not. So thank you. In terms of my stuff, obviously. <laughs> no, it's it's honestly amazing, to be honest, to be able to. So when I first joined the lab, for instance, um, Kate never looked into anything to do with the brain or aging or anything like that. Um, but we had the facilities here to be able to push forward my project and really establish everything that I needed um, in terms of microscopy facility. It's fantastic. It's one of the best, I think, around. Um, we have, uh, you know, other great machines um, that I'm able to look at a variety of different tissues and different aspects in terms of immune activation and inflammation and everything like that. And I have worked in a few places. So uh, back in Ireland, and it really was night and day coming here um, and seeing what was actually available to me that I would never have thought of it like, oh, I would love to do this, but not really sure. And then came like, oh, yeah, we have that upstairs on level seven, or we have this on level six. And so to be able to just kind of limitlessly, I suppose, uh, kind of push my project forward in many different aspects has just been fantastic. Thank you very much. And I believe, Larissa, you mentioned earlier the emergence of the PC3 laboratories, which also was enabled thanks to a gift from John and Georgina's story in those early days when there was a COVID onset and we knew that we needed to have greater sophistication in that space. And I know these two wonderful women have directly um, benefited from philanthropy as well. Now, this one final question in the room or on the, no, we're a very timid, quiet audience today. So with that, I might bring us to a bit of a wrap up and um, I am needing help directing this, Tim. <laughs> oh, we were talking about the kit and the tech and... <laughs> Um, so. 
I'm going to break it. It needs it needs the IT guy. My um, my number comes up in red letters on Tim's screen when I call, so he doesn't take the phone call. <laughs> Apparently, there's one other person in the building whose skills are less than mine in terms of being able to get things to work. So, oh, we've got the gorgeous Larissa back up, just so that just a gentle reminder of how dedicated she is to to the fence. All right. Well, I just want to bring us to a bit of a close here. Firstly, thank you to these four incredible researchers and their not only the dedication they have day in and day out, but taking important time out of their day to come and share this with you all firsthand. I'm sure you will all agree with me that it's incredibly exciting, their combined effort and initiative to address these despicable areas of disease. Um, so thank you very much for your very valuable time today. I'd also like to extend a very warm thank you to our friends who are online joining us to hear more about this firsthand. Um, this is the world that we live in now. We get to do things in a hybrid fashion and have friends with us here in the room and friends online at the same time. I also, I've mentioned philanthropy a couple of times, but I don't think I took the opportunity to mention that we have Director Circle members, which is the collective of like-minded community members to our work here at IMB. And I'm saying this now because we are about to say goodbye to our friends online, but I know that we've got Alan Grummet online, who is a wonderful contributor to our work, together with the Selwyn, who's here in the room with us today, and other people that have donated to the work and um, our combined ambition to make the world a better place and create change together. So thank you very much for that contribution to our efforts. So you'll see here, and it should be on your screen online, we would absolutely love your feedback. We would very much welcome it, both to um, our individual researchers today, but also about your experience with Meet the Research. Researchers. This is our last for 2021. I'm starting to say to people, I'll see you next week or I'll see you next year. Um, but I'm not quite ready for the Christmas music. But um, it's really important to us that we share with you information that is of value. And we do that in a way that it's meaningful to you. So this gives you a chance to give us that wonderful feedback. Also, for those of you who have come upon this event, either through the wider UQ network or on Facebook, and you aren't already um, hearing from us firsthand, if you follow this link, that gives you the opportunity to subscribe and hear more from us.